Hey there, everybody. Good morning. This is George from the Dinosaur George Company. This is uh, the Ask Dinosaur George segment. This is number 186. Hard to believe I've done that many. But uh, in this uh, Ask Dinosaur George segment, I am going to respond to some of the things you guys posted on YouTube, some of the questions that you posted, and then if I have time, I'll jump onto my Ask Dinosaur George page and answer some questions from there. I want to to make sure, because I know there's a lot of new people out there that maybe are not familiar with what we do. Okay, first of all, uh, if you have a question about paleontology, it doesn't have to be dinosaurs. It can be basically anything to do with paleontology. I, I like prehistoric fish and mammals and all that stuff as well. Um, you can go to the website, which is dinosaurgeorge.com. Over on the right-hand side, up at the top where the menu bar is, on the right-hand side, there's a drop-down menu. Click on that. You'll look down and you'll see Ask Dinosaur George. And there's a form that you can fill out that uh, where you can ask your question and submit it. Now, when you do, try to remember to keep it kind of short and to the point. If it's real long, like pages and pages, then uh, the, the individuals who go through those for me, because I simply don't have time to, to go through them all, they go through and they look for questions that are unique or that they think is, uh, would be interesting for a lot of people. And they, uh, they then forward those on to me and then I get those on a form and I can sit down, I just go through them and I read them and I answer them. Um, but if you, if you make it way, way long, I can tell you almost always they're not even going to read them. So just sort of an FYI. Now, I'm not talking about just submitting a one-line question. Don't make it that brief. But what I'm saying is for those of you who have submitted real long questions or like multiple questions, like 9, 10, 11 questions, those just rarely ever make it to me. So they may be great questions, but unfortunately, uh, since I never see them, I never get to answer them. The other way you can do it now is when we post a video here on YouTube, you can also post your question on here as well, but be aware, like the other ones, it's random. I can't answer every single one of them, unfortunately, so I just randomly go down and pick, and if yours is answered, that's what we do. So again, the website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check other things. We have a, a catalog, which if you're interested in buying stuff, I hope you'll consider uh, thinking about me as a place to get them from. All right, so... On the last one, which is Ask Dinosaur George number 185, I had a couple of people that posted some pretty interesting questions. So let's jump in there first and see. First, this is from the Time 67 who said, are there jobs in paleontology? Like so many, I had a dream of becoming one when I was younger, but never pursued the career in university. I instead opted for agricultural animal research, which does interest me. And I know there'll be jobs once I graduate, but I still wonder uh, what it could have been like if I would have followed my childhood dream. So, um, well, the time 67, first of all, let me tell you, uh, agricultural animal research is very near and dear to my heart. I grew up on a farm and ranch. We ranch cattle. Uh, we raised farm animals, every kind of animal you can imagine. So I am very interested in agriculture and agricultural animal research with paleontology. It is a unique science because it's not an enormous science. Now, it's big, but it's not enormous. You don't have the sheer volume of opportunity that you do in something like agricultural uh, animal research because there, there, are, there are a lot more farmers and ranchers than there are paleontologists. So your career choice is a good one. Um, I did not go to college and get my degree in paleontology either. My career was in retail. And as my career expanded and I got up into upper management, uh, I, I came to the realization that that's not what I liked. And so I made a choice and I basically created my own career. Now, that's not that easy to do. I was able to find a, a, a niche that that I worked in fine and, and worked out great for me. But um, it was a struggle, I can tell you. Um, in paleontology, what I would recommend to do, since you've already gone to a university and you sounds like you've got a career choice that's really, uh, really down a good, it's a good choice. I would recommend paleontology being a love and then you focus on your main career, but you may do what I did one day and you may decide that paleontology is something you want to do. 
the best way to get into paleontology is to get your degree. That's that's absolutely by far the best. You, you, if you take the route I took, it is years worth of work that had I gone to college probably would have been much easier to get to where I am now. But uh, it, it's always better. So I will say this. There's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of things to be discovered. And uh, uh, I would say you just keep going on what you're doing now. And then once you've gotten to the point where you decide whether uh, your agricultural animal research is what you want to do, that's great. But if it's not, you can maybe look at paleontology as maybe a follow up. All right. Uh, Henry Scott, love the channel. Hope you can continue great educational content. Thank you, Henry. I appreciate that very much. Okay. This is from, uh, oh my gosh, what a cool name. It's Oppenergic Cat Killer Pro. O P N I J E R C A T. Oppenergic Cat <laughs> Killer Pro. That's a cool name, anyway. Here's a question How well do you think Baryonyx would react to a fully grown, um, Let's see, how well do you think baryonyx would react to a fully grown, uh, I think you left out a word, how would it react to a fully grown what? Um, would it bolt or maybe roar a couple times and then run? I think you'd give it, uh, I'm guessing baryonyx, I, I'm guessing maybe your question would be how would it react to maybe another fully grown baryonyx? Would it stay and fight? Would it fight for its territory? I don't know, you know, that's a tough question. I would suspect that like other modern carnivores uh baryonyx would have been territorial i think all carnivorous dinosaurs would have been territorial i think those territories would range dependent on food source but i believe that it would at least put up a a fight maybe not a, an actual confrontational uh, uh fight but i would think that it would at least posture in a way to try to stop something else from moving into its own territory Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, I have to read this because this is hilarious. This is Albura, Alburad 08. Oreodont derives from the Greek word for cookie tooth. <laughs> That's actually very brilliant. I actually found that very cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Jaden DeMaio. Uh, wasn't Sue a female T-Rex? Could you count the chevrons in the tail? Rex with less are female because they lay eggs is a question. You know what? I don't know if, the, I think that was disproven. I believe what would happen, for those of you that may not be familiar, when you look at the tail of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the little downward pointing bones are called chevrons. And the idea was that if the, um, if the dinosaur had chevrons going all the way up to the base of its tail, then that would represent a male because... The, they would get in the way of a female laying the eggs. Those chevrons would get in the way as the eggs came out. But I believe that's now been disproven. Uh, I think that there's such a variety of chevrons that it's hard to determine which is male is which is female. Now, in order to determine definitively which is male and female, they look for something called medullary bone, which is a bone that, uh, uh, that a, a special formation of bone tissue that's only found in female birds and dinosaurs who were getting ready to lay eggs and so it's almost like a supply an extra supply of bone tissue that the calcium i think if i understand it correctly that the calcium can be drawn from to form the egg without making the actual bones of the animal brittle that's what i think the i think that was the definition of it but anyway, when they find that, that is definitive or as close to definitive proof as you can get that um, uh, that 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 is a female. So there but I don't think that the Chevron thing works anymore because I think that they found that there's not a standard basic thing. There's not a there's not like a set number of Chevrons that you can determine which is male and which is female. I think that's the case. Uh, okay. And then finally, uh, prehistoric King writes, do you think Tyrannosaurus had lips? Well, you know, that's an interesting question as well as did they have lips? Because there's been some debate about that. Now lips like ours are utilized to be able to form words. That's why ours are so dramatic. We can form and sound words that maybe other animals simply can't do. 
well, they, we know they can't do because they don't have the lip structure to do it. It's also used to hold food in when we chew. Did dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus have them? I don't think they were as pronounced, maybe, certainly not as pronounced as ours. But um, uh, I don't know, you know. I, I think their lips probably would have been more like reptiles, like if you see lizards and stuff like that. Those are the lips that I believe they would have had. All right, let's jump straight over into the Ask Dinosaur George page. I'm going to randomly go down this list of the ones that the people I talked about earlier forwarded to me. So let's go. This first one is from Lucas from San Luis Obispo, California. Lucas says, is there a modern relation to sauropods? There's not. There's not. Now, you could say that giraffes probably hold that same um, that same ecological uh, niche where they have an extended long neck to be able to take advantage of a food source that other dinosaurs didn't have. So that would be the closest thing. But there's not there's not a specific animal that I think would do that. OK, Frank from Stratford, Connecticut says, hello, Mr. Blassing. Hey, Frank, good to hear from you. Always call me Georgia DG. Mr. Blassing is appreciated. I appreciate your courtesy, but you're welcome to do that, Frank, especially you, because I've answered questions for you in the past. And so uh, I certainly consider you a friend. Frank says, I hope you had a great Christmas and New Year's. I did. I hope you did, too. The uh, question is, when paleontologists measure the length of sauropods like Giraffe, Titan, and Camarasaurus, were the necks in a more upright, those w- where the necks are more upright, do they measure the act- actual length or just the horizontal length? Thank you for answering my questions. I hope you have a great day. That is a brilliant question because generally when they talk about the length of a sauropod, they are looking at the length from the tip of the nose to the tail regardless of the position of the head whether the head is up or whether the head is out lengthwise the measurement is still the same now if you ever see a when they talk about height then they are talking about where the head is held so camerasaurus would be taller than diplodocus if diplodocus's neck is held more straight which i think it is camerasaurus is more upright so they would say Camarasaurus is taller than Diplodocus, but not longer. So length is determined from the tip of the nose to the tail, whether you start at the top and go down and then take a hard left and go down to uh, the tail or whether you whether your head is straight out from nose to tail. But that's a very good question, and I hope that made sense to you, my answer. All right, let's keep jumping through here. Uh, let's see, Caden. Uh, uh, Caden from Cobble Hill, British Columbia in beautiful Canada, freezing Canada. I love it up there. Hey, DG, how, um, how was your new year? How's your new year been? It's been great. Uh, Caden, I hope yours is too. Well, he said, I'd like to know what, what did you think about the trailer for Jurassic world? I have not seen it. Can you believe it? I, I've not seen the full trailer for the new Jurassic world. I saw bits and parts of it. I saw the part where the guy is running from a pyroclastic flow, which of course everybody is up in arms about because that's, that's just not realistic. And I get that. Uh, but it, it is, um, that's the only thing I've seen. I've actually tried to not watch (laughs) if that makes sense. I've tried not to watch because I, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, um, uh, I, I don't want to spoil it by getting too much of an opinion too early on. I want to be surprised when it comes out. All right, let's keep going here. This one is, uh, 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 let's see, this is Reed from New Folden, Minnesota. New Folden, Minnesota. Reed, good to hear from you. Hey, DG, do you think Spinosaurids had feathers? If they did, I think they would have had penguin or loon-like feathers where the pressure sensors were, they could have had whiskers. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, to your question about feathers, it, it, all of the evidence right now, the good evidence that I've read suggests spinosaurids are aquatic or semi-aquatic. They didn't live in the water, but they're semi-aquatic. They spend a lot of time there. So regular feathers are out the door. They're not going to have those kind of feathers because they would need wet, waterproof feathers, things more like ducks. Or like in your case, like you said, penguins or loons. Now, here's the deal about feathers on birds. They have a gland where they, where an oily-like substance is secreted, and they use that to coat their feathers to keep them waterproof. You ever seen ducks doing that? Ducks look like they're ruffling through their feathers. They're spreading and making sure that that 
that uh, secretion is is helps cover their feathers to make them waterproof. The problem with the Spinosaurid is he doesn't have the flexibility to be able to reach all the parts of its body to do that. So I doubt that they had many feathers, if any. I think if there's any evidence of a of a theropod not having feathers, it would be the Spinosaurids. I don't believe they would have had them because I think it would have been a very difficult for them them to be able to keep them waterproof if they needed them. I mean, who knows? Maybe they had waterproof feathers, but I I just don't believe they would have had feathers. As to your other question about the whiskers around the, the snout, when you look at crocodiles, they have these little pinholes all over and those little uh, pinholes can sense motion and movement. And so the idea is that even in murky water, they can sense a fish swimming by and snap it up and grab it. So it's possible that Spinosaurid, because they seem to have those little holes all over their noses, it may be possible that Spinosaurus also had sensors and maybe it wasn't whiskers necessarily because crocodiles don't have whiskers, just those holes serve the purpose. I believe that they may have had something like that to be able to assist them in catching their prey because you can't rely on clear water. In fact, you don't want to hunt in clear water because clear water means that your prey can see you just as easily. So I believe that they probably had sensors in their snout and maybe they kept their snout moving through the water. Um, if you ever seen a spoonbill or a, or uh, a spoon, I use spoonbill because they move their head from side to side and they go through the, the water and they can snap up anything that moves and they can filter feed and use that that mouth to stir up mud. They want it to be muddy. So I believe that they probably had sensors in their snouts that they would have used to be able to find their meal. All right, let's go with Zane from Bristol, Indiana. Hey, Dinosaur George, I got some more questions for you, buddy. Well, good, Zane. I've got some answers for you. Do you think dinosaurs could show emotions? Say a pair of T-Rexes witnessed their territory or a young being raided or maimed. Another question. Do you think that the males would have been dumped while taking care of young uh, a young and females? Oh, do you, th- <laughs> um, do you think the males would have felt like they got dumped when a female left them? <laughs> well, emotions. Okay. Emotions are not the same thing as behavior. Animals are born with certain behaviors. They react a certain way in a given circumstance. That's behavior. Emotion is something that is a feeling that's not necessarily behavior. In other words, crying is an emotion that occurs when something happens. Sadness or sorrow is an emotion that something happens defending yourself when something happens is different yes you can have anger associated with it but that is a reaction so that is a behavior so dinosaurs looking at their brain capacity it doesn't suggest that they have a tremendous amount of cognitive thinking so sorrow sadness happiness and joy may not necessarily been part of a dinosaur's life but they may have looked happy let's say for instance there's a drought and they smell the smell of rain and you see cows do this and antelope and sheep and goats do this they sort of jump around sort of excited well we could easily say oh my gosh look how happy they are but that may be more of a reaction to knowing that they're going to get a drink so i don't think that dinosaurs would have shown emotions like for instance if the male is courting a female and she turns him down I don't think he spends a couple of weeks crying and thinking about it. I think he simply moves on. He fights to try to to gain her uh, 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 affection or her, well, affection's the wrong word, attention. He's going to fight tooth and nail to do that, but that's because in his mind, he needs to perpetuate the species. Would a, would a T-Rex be mad if it witnessed something coming into its own territory? Not mad, but defensive in that it knows that in able to survive, it's got to defend its territory. I think it would immediately go in an attack. If it watched its babies being raided, uh, its nest being raided, or, or the babies being maimed, again, the goal of their brain is to ensure the success of the species. They're going to rush in not because they're defending junior 
but because they want to make sure that junior becomes an adult. That's the goal of all living animals to perpetuate the species. So it's probably not defending him because it thinks of, oh, my baby, it thinks more of that's the little thing that I'm supposed to raise to make sure it's an adult and I'm going to go protect that little thing. It probably doesn't even name it. It doesn't call him Ralph or Henry. It calls it the thing. So in my opinion, Zane, I think that dinosaurs would not have emotions, but I think there would have been some behaviors that we would very easily mistake for emotion. Um, But one last thing to say about that, though, I don't want to make it sound like animals are mindless because we look at mammals who clearly show emotion uh, at the death of an animal. They're they're distraught. They, They clearly are distraught by this. But that's usually found in the higher forms of, that's more a mammalian feature. It is bird to some degree. There are birds that do show like uh, birds that mate for life and that kind of stuff. So I don't want to make it sound like they're mindless. But what I would say is that it's less likely that they had emotional reactions as much as behavioral reactions. For all of you guys out there, uh, thank you all for taking the time to write to me. Uh, I will try to to shoot a couple more of these before I get into my busy season. Unfortunately, that's coming soon. My busy season starts in another week and then it gets crazy, but I'll still have some weekends to be able to do these. So for all of you that have taken time to to submit questions, thank you very much. I hope uh, my answers have been satisfactory for you. For those of you that would like to leave a question, uh, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Go over to the right on the menu bar. Look at the drop down, click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. While you're on my website, I hope you look at my catalog. Um, I've got a lot of stuff on there. And uh, for everybody out there, take care of yourself. Take care of the people around you. Um, Make sure to be kind to people. Make 2018 your best year. And if it's your best year, then it'll be people around you's best year because there's nothing better than spreading happiness. It is a great feeling and it gives you a feeling of accomplishment, and that is what life is about. Thank you all so much. Uh, Make sure to uh, uh, share my YouTube page. Make sure to follow it if you would, please. Make sure to like it, because that's the thing that will help me spread the word and get this cool info out. Take care, everybody, and I will see you all soon.